<laughs> happiness, a skeptic's guide. This podcast aims to bring you happiness, whatever your objections. Welcome to uh, the latest episode of Happiness, A Skeptic's Guide with myself, Paul Flower, and the esteemed Dr. Gary Wood. Oh, thank you. Uh, Over the next couple of episodes, we are talking about self-help and primarily the self-help industry, which uh, in America alone has a forecast value of $13.2 billion for next year. That's 2022. So it's to understand over the next two, three episodes what we believe self-help to be. You know, it's a kind of self-explanatory term in some respects and whether we actually are helped by the self-help industry and how we how we can best use it to our own devices. And uh, as an expert on this subject, because he has written a self-help book, at least one, I'm going to leave some of this to uh, Gary. Well, it, you, you're quite right, actually, because if it was really self-help, you wouldn't need a book, would you? No. Well, you know, as you said in the last episode, you know, there are, there's guidance. We all have coaches. We, we may all have a mentor at one point in our life. We didn't get from zero to, to where we are without a teacher. We recognise, I think, that people have been through it and people have good advice to dispense. It's how good that advice is, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think probably what, when we think of self-help, what we're thinking about is the perennial New Year, New You promotions yeah. where everybody's got a book. Yeah, and that obviously there are peak periods for these, and New Year is definitely one of them. But also that every year there appears to be at least one book, you know, that every publisher is looking for that that one book that's going to take off and capture the public imagination. Yeah. And every every year there is at least one of those. Yeah. I mean, there are, I mean, books, apps, podcasts, courses. And I think this podcast and the next couple are where the, the phrase sifting the science from the snake oil really comes into its own. You'll probably find on any bookshelf the book that says, this book can change your life in seven days. Yeah, they all say that. And then a couple of years later, the same author brings out a book that says, this book will really change your life in seven days. And then a couple of years later, honest, this book, yeah. you can trust me, <laughs> governor, this book will really... And you're thinking, if the first book worked, why do we need the second two? And the fact is that self-help industry thrives on repeat business yeah it's like the movie industry like in that respect yeah on fast and furious 92 yeah it's exactly the same thing now when i wrote my second book i was looking at the format and the, the formula and when i realized that self-help thrived on repeat business i was thinking i'm doing this all wrong then because i tried to throw everything into the book everything i knew and apparently what you should do is eke it out a bit so that was my mistake. There was a door slamming in the background, which was very appropriate. So that's oh, good. was it? Well, the na- <laughs> sound, well, my neighbours upstairs sounds like they're moving a body again. Right. Anyway, but no, it was, it was a door slamming on that very thought of yours that you know one book would do it. But it, it you know, it's a very dense and practical book, and we should name it, which is uh, "Don't Wait for Your Ship to Come In, Swim Out to swim Meet out It." Swim out to meet it. Yes. And um, you know, in some respects, it's probably. There's too much detail in there, you know, yeah. and that's not that's not me being critical. It's been a long time since I looked at it, but you know, I that's the kind of book actually now that I think, yeah, I could I could face that book now. I could I would have a better grip on it. <laughs> I won't throw up over that book anymore. <laughs> also got a wipe clean cover. Yeah. I mean, that book's probably four books anyway. I've done some work as a, what we call in the UK an agony aunt or uncle. I'm going to be an uncle, advice columnist. Yeah, And somebody will write to you with this terrible dilemma. And it, and on the magazines I've worked for, they were real letters. And you've got to answer this terrible dilemma in 100 to 150 words. And you think, how the hell do you do that? And the answer is, is you give some general advice and then you recommend a good book on that subject. And it's a key strategy that's used. And we talked in the last episode about talking therapies. And there's something called bibliotherapy, book therapy. And it's just when the therapist might recommend a book 
to supplement the process. So instead of just talking to the therapist, the relationship becomes more between the like the dynamic interaction between the reader and the book. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be a self-help book. It can be a novel, plays, poems. Think about Shakespeare. And I'd rather not. So, what, but essentially, what you're saying <laughs> is that the book club is kind of promoted this idea that we can kind of delve deeper into books as a group of people and get more out of them as a result? Well, even the, or individually, I mean, we can have a group book club, but bibliotherapy is just about the, the you, you go off and you just read a book and you apply it to yourself. And I did mention Shakespeare before you cut me off, but he deals with some really heavy issues, you know, things about madness. Dressing up as a woman. That's got to be edited, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All of his characters are dressing up as a man or a woman in various yeah. books. There, there was, in various yeah, plays. Various gender subterfuges. Uh, yeah, and, and, and you and, know, mistaken identities, and this person is that person. And it, 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 he was repeating uh, author, that's for sure. Yeah, he was. And also, he borrowed a lot from other authors. Uh, mm -hmm. And so he was a great collector and uh, possibly paved the way for a more enlightened view of gender, which is clearly you need in this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, we started off by asking, what is self-help? It's defined as an action or process of doing things to improve yourself or solve problems without the help of others, except with a book. And the benefits of a self-help book would be that they're cheap, they're accessible, and they, work, they do actually work for less severe problems. And I've already mentioned it, but you can go and get a book and you can work on it on your own. So you might not know yet. You, you, you might think, do I need to go and talk to someone? A book might be that bridging gap for you to say, OK, I'm not sure. And it might be that the book helps you slot things into place and it is the little push you need to go and talk to somebody else. Yeah, it's a, it could be a conduit to, to kind of getting more help. You know, if the book doesn't work for you, then it might be that, you know, or parts of the book might work for you, but then it might be that you kind of need to explore that in greater depth with another trained qualified person perhaps but i suppose self-help's a sort of diy isn't it you know and and i do have some sympathy for for the thought that this is my brain my brain is is giving me the this grief this this mental health is is my own issue it is caused by my brain and i should be able to control it you know that that's something i've come to kind of have as a mantra of sorts from perhaps a little bit from self-help but you know it is you know it, this is me this is what I'm feeling so therefore I I should be able to get a grip of it it is quite I mean it's almost an insidious theme that runs through books think about you know when we've been through periods of austerity and people have lost everything you think about the pandemic and lots of those things were out of people's control but their, their emotional reactions are, are, are technically within their control. And I think sometimes the self-help industry, I think uh, it, it overemphasizes personal control and underemphasizes the pressures are on us, problems with living, as the uh, psychiatrist Thomas Zartz would say. Sure. I mean, that, that's such a bigger issue, though, isn't it? That, you know, the, you know, and different for each country that you're in. So therefore, it'd be very hard to be universal on, on that front. You're not going to have a worldwide bestseller when you're trying to say that the problems are actually caused by society you live in. No, it really depends on the society, doesn't it? I think you've hit there on the downside of the self-help book is the one size fits all. So if you don't really get to have a personal relationship with the author in any, any sense. But I think it helps if the book is written in probably a more conversational language. So you actually, you can hear the author's voice. I think that's what we've been trying to do with these podcasts. It's important that you can hear authentic voices rather than it being totally scripted. So if you read something out loud from a self-help book, does it sound like somebody's speaking or does it sound like you're reading something out loud? And I think that's often a test. And you can just flick through a book and you can find out, is the author speaking to me? So in some ways, it can fulfill that function that a, a therapeutic relationship has. You know, we talked about last one, uh, the core factors of the relationship with the therapist. So maybe a book can can help to bridge that. Do you think it's helpful then that, um, you know, a lot of these the self-help gurus have become sort of bigger, so they're television stars now or they're YouTube stars. Do you think it's better that some people feel that they have a relationship with X or Y, let, 
because they've seen them on television. So they think that that person is more trustworthy. They feel like they know them. Yeah, I think that's a danger. And I, I think some of the, the, the very famous gurus, some of the advice they offer is not necessarily based in science anymore. It's their homespun philosophy that tends to resonate. It's a bit like famous politicians who throw out some populist phrases and you might throw out 20 phrases and whichever one catches and gets goes viral on Twitter is what they'll run with. And I, I think there's a, there's a danger of it ceasing to be self-help and it becomes more fan-based. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it reminds me of, I got a review actually for Don't Wait For Your Ship To Come In and it was on Amazon and it was one of the very few times I was lost for words because the person wrote, this is an average self-help book and I won't argue <laughs> with them there. But they said, as you need to apply the advice within if you are to gain something. And I okay. thought, what? <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> and the point is, is that some people do not buy self-help books to change. Some people buy self-help books to reinforce their worldview. Okay. And so they're almost comfort blankets. And, and then that's where the repeat authorship comes in. So I bought so-and-so's book. Oh, they've got another book out. So it just becomes a sense of reassurance. Now, we, if we go way back to one of the podcasts on stress, we talked about emotion-focused coping and control-focused coping. So when you're buying a book out of fandom because you, you, know, you like the author, that's more dealing with an emotional aspect. When you're buying a book because you want to change or you want to look at the world in different ways, that's more of the control focus. Sure. It's interesting you talked about populism, though, because I think um, we have mentioned this before, and it is one of my favourite facts, but the, the first self-help book was actually called Self-Help. Yep. It was, it was written by a guy, a very appropriately named Samuel Smiles, who just had happens to be the great great grandfather of Bear Grylls which is another name in itself but he had some advice in there that kind of in modern times we would say is, is contrary to, to realism but it's very much of the populist belief that certain people you know have the right get up and go and they can conquer anything and everybody can do this because you know we all have it within us and blah 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 you know and you just think wow really you know that that is such a populist point of view work harder get more isn't it it, it, it was written in 1850 i think 1858 59 it was originally turned down by routledge who coincidentally published uh, the psychology of well-being which has currently been read by you three nuns in a whippet uh, whereas <laughs> self-help went on to be a massive bestseller i'm not bitter but it was really immersed in victorian values it was all about the individual. So they were talking about examples of exceptionalism. This person did it so you could do it. Mm. But if you needed any recommendation for not reading that book is that Margaret Thatcher wanted to give it a copy of it to all school children in the UK. Yeah. My views on Margaret Thatcher are well known. Very similar to mine, I would imagine. Yes. Uh, not, I, I, yes. Not hugely positive. No, no, say. not usually positive. Uh, it, she she always claimed that she spent four hours a night sleeping. Sleeping in a coffin, yeah. yeah well, sleeping. And everybody thought, well, wouldn't it be lovely if she had a lion? Yeah. <laughs> it would. Anyway, and if we look at the Samuel Smiles book, Self-Help, we can see the blueprints for all self-help books still to this day. I mean, I've been reading stuff like... If somebody doesn't like you, it's because they're jealous of you or it's because they want to be you. And you're thinking, well, this is utter rot. Because, you know, how would you apply that to a serial killer? Yeah. So a lot of the advice in self-help books, it cannot be applied to the real world. No, and it's not, not applicable to everybody anyway, yeah. is it? If you do something that somebody doesn't like, it's their problem, not yours. Yeah, what about frottage on public transport? <laughs> uh, you know, you think about it, it's just... And, and these memes proliferate on Twitter. And I often... You probably see me commenting that people go, psychology says, and then they put the most inane piece of piffle and drivel, and I go, what psychology says it? Because psycho... And, and I that's think that's your favourite theme of the day, actually. Yeah. That's what you spend every day on Twitter doing. <laughs> but, that, but, but the thing is, is what happens is psychology says and studies indicate 
And you should be able to follow up and say what psychology says and what studies yeah. indicate. And, of course, those never get responses, do they? I've, I've never seen a response to that no, question. No, nobody's when, ever responded. You posted it. Yeah. Because they're mostly posted by bots. That's the problem. So, you know, populist, some popular psychology requires popping. Yeah. You know, it, it is not one size fits all. You should be able to find a self-help book that kind of – speaks to you but you don't just want it to reaffirm who you are you you know you're looking to it for help and some of that help is help to change isn't it you know that yeah if we look at it there are pretty much four different types of self-help book there's growth relationships coping and things to do with identity and we can group those into problem focused books versus growth oriented books and if we think about problem focused books they're things we want to move away from and if we think about growth oriented books they're things we want to move towards so we might want to move away from unhappiness but we might not be yet ready to move towards happiness it might need we probably need to buy two books for that okay and that's a very good point because we need probably two to three episodes to get through self-help itself yeah and you know it's a 13.2 billion dollar industry so therefore it requires some conversation we've got to do it justice there's also the act do self-help books work uh, because they rep- uh, thrive on repeat business. And there's a lot of research to indicate that, yes, they do help, especially with things like learning a skill. Although the Internet's taken over from some of that, that we can just listen to podcasts, uh, we can watch videos. But there's the, the one piece of research showed that people use bibliotherapy. It's no less effective than some forms of therapy. So it can work for some people better than for others uh, at least some of the time doesn't sound like a snappy phrase does he so they work a bit uh, <laughs> for some people some of the time sometimes well i wow. think if you walked if you walked into a bookshop as too few people do these days and you go to the psychology or self-help section it's going to be full of books and not all of them are for you you can't possibly read all of them you know you have to find the right ones that they kind of speak in a language you understand and and will help you to the next stage so i think that's what we're kind of looking at in subsequent episodes how to read the self-help book the gurus of the industry and um what they have to say on this subject and whether we agree indeed you've just been at a point of going into a bookshop i'm not a fan of the of ebooks i i do like a proper paper copy of the book but it has helped with men accessing self-help books because the electronic book is a little bit more anonymous so you don't have to go into a bookshop and ask someone excuse me could you point me to the book on this embarrassing ailment yeah i see what you mean because you did have some you've got some very good statistics in the psychology of well-being i'm flicking through my copy now to see if i can find them but it, it was more on which gender Oh, it's it's mainly women. Uh, it's uh, women between the age of 20 to 49 who, who have a higher education. So it f- accounts for 49 percent. Intelligent women, basically. It, yeah. So it's it, it is intelligent women, 20 to 49 year olds tend to look at self-help books. So it's clearly people who are wanting to try and, you know, do what we've been talking about. And for the self-help fresh impact. for the self-help books that are written by women, they have a, um, I think, 87 percent. Uh, readership who are women you know men are not reading those books yeah men are going to read books by men and they're going to read books on things like productivity and business success and all that stuff yeah how to how to nail you know a a nail into a block (laughs) how to nail everything how to nail everything down or tape everything (laughs) up that's that's going to be the title of my book or jig it with oil (laughs) whatever so so that that is men that is men nail it down shape it up euphemism cover it in oil so yeah. oh, that sounds, oh, dear me, that sounds a bit dodgy, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, that might that might come out in the edit. Uh, I do have a lot of background noise. I think uh, somebody's digging Margaret Thatcher up actually outside my house, but uh, we, who knows? Um, I think that's a, a really good place to end. You know, there there is a self help book probably that can help you, but finding it is is the subject probably of our next episode. Pretty much, if we if we wanted to sum that up, is you would choose a self help book like you would choose a therapist. So you would check the credentials. You would check the author uh, you make sure it's evidence-based and i will end on the note that the chances are if it's written by little yimini rainbow jones who's been raised by wolves and speaks to angels and a former accountant from tunbridge yeah. wells chances are it's not evidence-based no it's not for you <laughs>
because you haven't been <laughs> raised by wolves and speak well, to yeah, angels. Well, hell's angels, possibly, but not. No. Uh, so not anyway, traditional that's angels. it. But I, I do like the name of Little Yemeni Rain Cloud Jones. Yeah. Or, well, that that's that's the one we're going for. How to nail everything by Little Yemeni Rainbow Jones. That's can our you self help. Pro- sorry, can you pronounce my name properly? Yemeni, <laughs> Yemeni, with your. <laughs> Anglicised pronunciation. My anglicised black country pronunciation. So that's pretty much it. So pick a book like you pick a therapist. Do some research and, and you can't go wrong. Excellent. Let's hope. Well, you can go wrong, but, uh, you know, there are plenty of Oh, you sport it now. You can go wrong, but there are plenty of choices out there. That's for sure. You, you, you will be able to go more right than wrong. Excellent. Thanks again for joining us. That was and is Happiness, a Skeptic's Guide with Paul Flower and me, Gary Wood. Remember to hit the subscribe button wherever you find your podcasts so you'll be the first to know about new episodes. And if you've really enjoyed it, you can support the show at buymeacoffee.com forward slash skepticsguide. And a big thank you if you've already done so. 